Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week. And this week, Chris's selection, the newest and only album from Torelli Leone's Rhapsody, Zero Gravity. But before we get there, Chris, how are you, my friend? Doing well. It was uh, a long week, as I know you agree with. But uh, we're going to finish it off strong and talk about Italian people. Yes, and I, I look forward to it. Before we get to the, the, the main event or the main Italians, uh, another uh, Italian band that I wanted to mention is a band called Poison Rose. They just released their debut album on Frontiers Records. It's called Little Bang Theory. And it was a kind of an interesting lineup. It has Alessandro Del Vecchio on bass and keyboards, and he's kind of the mastermind behind the Frontiers label. But also on the album is uh, Aldo from Secret Sphere on guitars, and the entire album was written by vocalist Marco Sivo, which is kind of interesting because uh, if anybody was a fan of Time Machine back in the day, uh, that old progressive metal band from Italy, Marco was the main singer for uh, their last release back in 2004. So it's kind of the first time that I've heard this guy sing in about 20 years. And uh, definitely a different style than than Time Machine, obviously more in line with what you expect to hear on Frontiers. A little grungy at times too, but definitely uh, definitely worth a listen. So that's, that's Poison Rose. I'll, I'll post the track this week. And uh, Spheric Universe Experience, one of my favorite prog bands out of France, released their new video, uh, which came out, I believe, uh, yesterday, called Where We Belong. And it was uh, a nice six-minute song, and their album is due out May 20th. I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, did you have a chance to listen to anything new or catch up on any of the new stuff? Not really. Um, I spent a lot of time listening to uh, this Luca Torelli, Fabio Leone album, and... Um... I know I saw that the Shaman and Semblant both had new albums that came out today, but I did not had a chance to listen to them as of yet. Um, other than that, it was kind of uh, kind of a quiet week. I think um, uh, Zero Hour dropped another single from their upcoming album, and um, Visions of Atlantis did as well. Uh, but I mean, in all honesty, I just didn't really get too much of a chance to listen to. Um, to too much, you know. I, I'm sure we were probably going to mention it towards the end of the show, but as long as we're talking about stuff we listened to, I did get a chance to listen to the um, the Overload album from Spectra. It was their uh, debut album that came out last year, and uh, they are going to be replacing North Tail at Prog Power this year. Um, and apparently, they're they are uh, Jeff Scott Soto's band for his set. So they were going to be there anyway. So it just kind of works out, but I enjoyed that album quite a bit. So I think that's a, uh, a pretty solid, uh, uh, replacement for a band that might've flown under a lot of people's radars, including mine. Yeah. And, and kind of a band that like, I'm not sure you would ever get a chance to see, but for the, confluence of events that have created this year's festival so i'm definitely looking forward to that uh not not that hard to digest either it's kind of straightforward stuff but it's it's good and and to be honest with only one album it's kind of the something that people can listen to see if they like it and if they do maybe check them out because uh you know it's, it's not like you have to go back into flotsam and jetsam's uh extended uh discography to to, to get familiar with them it's one they're a one and done and then obviously they'll be backing up soto like i you said. i feel i feel bad for those poor unfortunate souls that need to go back and listen to the entire flotsam and jetsam discography well um, I, I i love the reference uh I, I i consider myself a little bit of a little mermaid aficionado no, that, not, that I reminds me have you seen the the video that um elizabeth zaroff put out i think it came out today of her um, preg like visibly pregnant, dressed up as Ursula, singing "Poor Unfortunate Souls." No, I missed that. I uh, I'm curious. How was it? I've never heard her sing. Actually, uh, I haven't watched it. I just saw the <laughs> the thumbnail for it on YouTube, and I was like, "Oh, that's got to be good." I, I, just oh, I know what you're doing. I had a chance show. to watch it, but she's wonderful. So it's so any chance to uh, see her do anything is always. Um, <laughs> Lovely, but uh, yeah, I was going to mention that. Um, as also, um, I noticed on the the Prog Power uh, T shirt design, which 
props to Wayne Joyner. This is another really like sharp, the color scheme, I think just looks really cool. Um, and, uh, for those who are not in the know, you can, um, pre-order your shirt now. Um, I put my order in, um, but I noticed that, um, Spectra was, um, at the bottom of the Thursday night lineup. So I'm wondering if, uh, will the run got pushed up a slot, um, because of the the switch, um, that so, is my understanding that they yeah, everything so, got bumped up, which which makes sense because again, Spectra, you know, they, I don't know that they have as much uh, notoriety as as you know, Wilder Runner or or uh, obviously anybody that's coming after them. So I think it's I think it, they're they're well placed. I look forward to them opening the show, and uh, as a big Wilder Run fan, it's always nice to see them as well. I got I gotta say, even with this change, I still think. Thursday has the uh, the potential to be the the best day of the four day festival uh, for at least for my taste as somebody who actually um, does enjoy Pain of Salvation and then I mean and they're the band I probably am least interested to see of all five um, so uh, that I think that bodes well for the the entire evening but um, you know I know that the I know that the the festival promoters are, are, are frustrated and, and there's been a lot of changes and stuff, but you know, all told like the four day lineup is still really strong. There's still a lot to look forward to. And one of the bands that I'm most looking forward to has just happens to be uh to really Leone Rhapsody who we're going to talk about today. Yeah. I am so happy you picked this album. I have to be honest with you. I remember when I first heard it, when, when it came out, uh, or, or quite frankly, I remember when they announced it back, uh, they announced it in 2018, early 2019. And, uh, the, the album was released on July 5th of 2019. I struggled with this album when it came out. I appreciated it for what it was in terms of obviously the, the, the symphonic and the cinematic elements were fantastic. Uh, we'll get into that. I think Fabio's vocals speak for itself in many ways. We'll get into that. But for some reason, I, I kind of struggled with this release a little bit. So I'm glad you went back and, and kind of forced me to, to go listen to it. When I think about that set, automatically I was thinking about, you know, play the old stuff, right? Like all the stuff that, that we kind of grew up on and the stuff that we obviously talked about you know, in the archives when we spoke about um, Legendary Tales, that is my my kind of wheelhouse for Rhapsody, those first three or four albums. For some reason, this, w- w- I guess I'll say it this way, when when the band had the schism and kind of went in different directions, and since then it's been a long and winding road to get to where we are now, this album was such a marked change in direction that it just kind of lost me and I was not prepared for what it was. But having gone back, I think I might like this stuff more than anything I've heard from the band since Symphony of Enchanted Lands. And I am shocked to say that because obviously I, I hold a lot of their stuff in high regard. But this was a fantastic listen. It just took a while. And maybe that's on me for not spending enough time with it three years ago. Yeah, I I, for, I don't know if there was just it was just the timing and there was just a glut of, of other things that might have come out right around the same time. But I think I, I listened to it maybe once or twice and, and didn't think much of it. I, I didn't think it was bad by any means, but nothing really spectacular stood out outside of uh, the first three tracks, which were all released as, as singles. So I listened to those a bit more, but um, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like Luca to really has been trying to shed the um the kind of medieval image of of his version of rhapsody and i kind of feel like maybe we haven't been paying close enough attention to what he's been doing because in all honesty like even if you go back to his second solo album which came out in 2002 like that album was a complete departure from the king of nordic the king of the nordic twilight album which we discussed on another episode, which was very much um, had that kind of uh, medieval flair that Rhapsody was known for at the time. And then Prophet of the Last Eclipse was almost like more of a futuristic kind of thing. It was almost similar to what Glory Hammer did, where they went from like their first album was like this um, 
kind of medieval story and then and then the second album was like a futuristic story it was kind of like um a good whole like the style like the power metal bones were still there but the everything around it was kind of um modernized and, and i feel like luca on his own has been kind of maybe not interested in doing the whole medieval like style and maybe that's what led to his departure from Rhapsody in the first place. But I mean, I, I think musically this album doesn't differ very much from the two albums he released under the Luca Torilli's Rhapsody banner. In all honesty, it's just now it has Fabio and maybe that's the, the X factor, maybe hearing, you know, having Fabio and Luca together again, I don't know if we were expecting something more along the lines of those early Rhapsody albums that you mentioned, but, um, this to me is more like Luca Torelli's Rhapsody, but replace Fabio or, you know, replace uh, Alessandro with Fabio. Yeah. And it's funny because when they kind of like rebranded, if you will, they even said it was a new generation of symphonic metal, which obviously, I mean, obviously right away, you can tell this is a symphonic metal album and a symphonic metal album that only Luca can do. But they completely shed that medieval feel. And I think that it just kind of put a more modern spin. And I, I remember sending you a text earlier this week and I said, you know what this reminds me of? This is like Marvel movie symphonic metal as opposed to like Final Fantasy symphonic metal or something, you know, going back. It was like, it almost reminded me of like when, when that series, like in, in seven, when they finally, uh, when, when Final Fantasy goes modern and you're, they're driving like, motorcycles and stuff like that as opposed to like dealing with wizards and stuff like that that's what this is and i just don't think i was ready for it and you know you brought up prophet of the last eclipse that's another album that i i mean and obviously now we're going back 20 years i never got into that album either it just fell flat for me and i never ever really gave it more than maybe a handful of spins Maybe it's something we have to go back to at some point, but I just never got into that and while i obviously appreciated a lot of lucas material I, I don't know that it ever resonated as much as those first Rhapsody albums but that's because in my head that's what it was supposed to sound like but having done a deep dive into this um, I, I have a lot of work to do this this was a real formative experience for me in many ways and I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you chose it because I can unequivocally say that I am really looking forward to their set more than I was because if they play three or four or five songs off this album I'm into it. I'm, now, I'm not saying it was perfect. I have my complaints and I'll, I'll get there. But for the most part, especially the first two thirds of this album, phenomenal. I, I'm glad that you uh, enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Um, I, I urge you to go back and listen to the Prophet of the Last Eclipse album. Um, at least at least three songs on that album are, are I think, all-time classic Luca Torelli songs. I think the intro track war of the universe um prince of the starlight which was kind of the preview track that they dropped before the album came out um demon heart if you got a hand uh get your hands on the one of the bonus editions you could hear andre matos uh sing in place of fabio which is kind of cool mm -hmm. um it, it's definitely worth a, a listen um I, I really enjoyed it it was the third one the infinite wonders of creation that that one kind of lost me i don't oh, know that, that totally I really... lost me I, I listened to that once i, I just yeah and then I, and then there was luca Turilli's dream quest they made an album um called lost horizons and that was just another one that um i kind of that one was kind of lost on me as well so i mean i don't know i i, I thought that like when luca came back with luca Turilli's rhapsody that like that was kind of peak. I listened to that first album that they made ascending to infinity a lot, like a lot. Um, probably in, in, in anticipation of seeing Luca Turley's Rhapsody at Prague power. Um, but um, that album was, I thought it was fantastic. Um, and, uh, I thought the second album, the Prometheus album was quite good as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like you said, I'm glad you kind of, posited it as like a, a long and winding road um because that the kind of is the history of this band i mean i didn't even bother trying to like re um acquaint myself with the roster maneuverings be between the the multiple versions of rhapsody but 
all I know is that like this new version of Rhapsody with with Luca and Fabio is pretty much just the classic um, mid mid aughts era, uh, like two thousand five ish era of Rhapsody of Fire. Um, you know, with uh, uh, with Patrice and, and Dominique, um, the two uh, you call them the French Connection, um, and then uh, with uh, with Alex Holsworth, um, and then Luca and Fabio. I mean, it's kind of funny. There's only two actually Italian <laughs> guys in this band: it's, uh, <laughs> a German, two Frenchmen, and two Italians. So it's, little it uh, the world beaters, if you will. <laughs> Do you remember that scene in A Beautiful Mind where they're kind of like? filming over John Nash's shoulder and he's working on something on the wall. And then all oh, of a sudden they, it's, one, they, it's one of my favorite movies. Then they pull, they obviously they pan back and then you see this like crazy, crazy thing on the wall with the arrows and everything. That's how I feel about trying to keep up with who's in this band because it's just like, it's just absolute chaos and madness. Um, so I, I'm glad you didn't even attempt that exercise. Uh, but I'm sure you did listen to the album. How, how many times did you listen to it this week? Five times. Nice. I'm listening to it again right now as we speak, as a matter of fact. I like it. And I guess, let me say this. It was, it was, even this week was a bit of a winding road for me because I remember the first time I listened to it, I was, I think I shot you a text and I said, I think I made a gross mistake here by not paying more attention to this back in the day. Uh, and by back in the day, I mean three or four years ago when it came out. But by the same token, I can't say that every listen I got the same phenomenal enjoyment but i would say three or four out of the five times i was completely on board with this one of the times that i listened i think i was just consumed with other things or other thoughts and it was a little bit dense and a little bit hard for me to get through but for the most part i really enjoyed it and i think that this stuff is going to be phenomenal live um but with with that let's kind of just jump right into it because uh it's not a terribly long album but whenever i think you have a luca Torelli album there's just so much going on and so much uh, the word i used was dense there's so much density to the material that it's it can be a little bit of a daunting task but this one moved pretty well for me uh the the album starts with a song called Phoenix Rising, and I guess that's a really appropriate name for for the you know the start of the new era, if you will. Um, and there's almost like a spoken word countdown that's kind of behind the piano intro, which is cool. And then the track takes off like a rocket ship, and it's really really fast, really really catchy, and really really melodic. I don't think it's a perfect song. I think the bridge for me kind of took me out for a bit, but then they go back into that really awesome riff, and I, I can see why they opened the album with this. I have to think that you love this track. Am I am I correct in saying that? Yeah, yeah, and and I think it was um, I think it was the first single also that was released. So this was kind of our first taste of, of this new or old, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, uh, formation of the band. Um, the, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that it reminded you of a Marvel movie because the beginning of the song to me just sounds like a Marvel trailer, like for a trailer for one of the, the, you know, Marvel cinematic universe films. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, it just kind of like kicks in with the, this, this kick-ass riff and, um, it's not my favorite song on the album, but I think it is one of um, one of my favorites, and I think it just really kind of kicks things off. It's kind of a long song, um, but I I think that the reason that it does that it's not as dense or doesn't feel as dense because there's not really a lot of the filler kind of stuff that you used to get on those old Rhapsody albums that were kind of like segues and intros and things like that. This one kind of just gets right to business and it kind of just, there's like a two minute, uh, like there's a two minute, two and a half minute track, like kind of right in the middle of the album. Um, but other than that, like the, the album's always moving. So like, I don't know that there's as much of that kind of, uh, just segue ish kind of stuff. It just is like, a, it's kind of like all business. And, and that's, I think more of a, a, more, more of that just kind of style of album that they used to do. It was just kind of like, that was just how they did it. It was like minute and a half symphonic classical style intro, you know, followed by some, bombastic power metal track which in this one they're just like let's there's kind of an intro but the song is is up and running within 
under a minute of the the album starting. So I, I think that there, there's there seems to be more focus on the the meat and potatoes, if you will, of this of the the music here. Yeah, no, no question about it. And then it kind of goes right into the second track where we get our first of a, a pair of really interesting guest spots on this. And it's Elise Reed from Amaranth who, who sings on the second track. It's called DNA demon, uh, demon and angel. This is a really good track. And you and I think her vocals kind of shine here. It's kind of interesting when you think about it, because I never thought of her singing in this style, but she does it really well. So I, I happen to like this one a lot. This one again has that movie score start to it, but again, it picks up, it gets really heavy and really dark for a Rhapsody song. And I think that that's one of the things that struck me about this album. Symphony of Enchanted Lands, I think, was always my favorite because it had elements of darkness that Legendary Tales maybe did not. This is a really dark album in many ways. And I thought that when I listened to it with the headphones... Uh, especially because when I was in the car, certain things didn't pop for me, but I, I listened to it with headphones and I listened to it a, another time with earbuds. The backing vocals and the orchestration just popped so much. And it really what separates this from so much other power metal that's out there. But the, it was the darkness to this track that I particularly enjoyed. Yeah, um, I think I think it's going to be my song of the week. Um, I mean, I, I, there's so much I love on this album, but I just this song. I mean, this was the one I was probably most familiar with going into it. Um, the the duet style here is so is done so well. Um, it's just really good, and I kind of just kept thinking to myself, like, if they play this at Prague Power, like, who would you want to see? get on stage with Fabio and, and I think immediately, and mind you, these might be the only female vocalists that I'm thinking that I, that I think are going to be around, but I think of Adrian from seven spires. And I also think of Sarah from mind maze as well. Um, either one, I think would be like a, a absolute treat. Um, but uh, I, I think they should just fly Elise in and have her do uh, a guest spot with all the bands that like that she's done guest spots with. Cause she's done, she was on the last conception album. She was, uh, she did guest spot on Arion's debut album. Um, she's on this album. So I figured have her just come out for every band's set and <laughs> sing one song with the band. And she could be like, I, the official hostess of, of Prague power. I have no argument with that. I just will read one line from my notes because it is completely, I think, appropriate. Quote, get Adrian Cowan on the phone and have her do a guest spot. That is literally word for word for my notes. So you took the words uh, right out of my mouth. It would be the perfect song for that. And I hope that they, uh, I honestly hope that they don't pipe in the vocals just because I think it'll take something away from the performance aspect. But I love the idea of hearing that live. I, I would get chills. Yeah. I mean, br- br- you know, bring out Adrian or Sarah. Or don't play the song. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much. Um, I, also, I think a very strong candidate for song of the week. I, I agree. I'm not going to choose it. I, I have something else in mind, but this was. Yeah, very I, I, might, I, I, I think I, I'm not going to put it in stone just yet, but it, it's definitely pretty, pretty up there. I, I, I'm going to. I'm, I'm kind of re-listening as we go, um, just to see if anything jumps out that I might have forgotten. But I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that this is it but we'll see all right very good very good uh track three zero gravity uh another 
kind of heavy, fast, and dark number. Um, this this song I thought was not quite as good as 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 DNA. Uh, tough tough act to follow, I have to say, but a very very good track uh, in in its own right. And, and again, I just can't impress upon the listeners enough. Listen to this with some earphones because this this is the type of music that you need to really kind of immerse yourself in. And this is one of those tracks that I think does a really nice job of that. It's, it's, I, I enjoyed listening to it in my car. Don't get me wrong. And I was kind of, you know, moving my head along and drumming on the steering wheel at times. But at the same time, listening to it with, with kind of this ambient sound or qualities that, that, that headphones would give or earbuds, you know, very good earbuds would give. It took this music to another level, so I think that it's definitely worthwhile. But getting back to the song, uh, a step down, not a perfect song, but it's it's definitely not a bad song by any by any means. Yeah, I like this one a lot too, and this kind of concludes the trilogy of songs that I was very well aware of versus the rest of the album, which I was not. Um, just because I think this was the this was the, I think they released a video or something for this on the day that the album was released. Um, so this was like the third big song that I, that I listened to. And I, I love how it just starts out so unassumingly. And it almost sounds like you're about to hear a, a ballad. And then all of a sudden it's just like, no, nope, no, nope, psych. It's, uh, yeah. it's another, it's another ass kicking power metal song. But, uh, it, it's, I love just the modern symphonic power metal style, which I feel like be like being that they are, their own kind of um, in- influence. Like Rhapsody is such a huge influence on the symphonic power metal genre uh, as a whole. Uh, I put them at, and Nightwish kind of as two of the biggest influences there. Um, it's, it's cool to kind of hear them get away from the whole medieval style and do this more of a modern feeling album because I think it really works. I think it's just, you have to, kind of get yourself out of that mindset. And I think the both of us kind of went through that, that, that kind of uh, evolution, so to speak uh, of listening to this and, and kind of listening to it with a, a different, a different mindset. Um, and, and this song is just like a complete, like a completely perfect example of that. in, in the fact that it's just, just a really kind of modern sound, but at the same time still has that symphonic, um, power to it as well as like the, the great um you know choral uh you know the choruses like with the whole choral group going and and the, there's just so many layers to this to this music that it just makes it always interesting and and that's why i think you have to listen to it a few times because of of, of how like you said the density of it all you're not gonna you're not really going to appreciate it all in in one one listen you know you listen to it once and then put it down and then move along i think you're you're not going to really get that full experience yeah very 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 well said um and, and i should note you know uh, alessandro conti does backing vocals on the album uh emil ragni who i was not really familiar with but apparently she has recorded some other albums she, she's also involved with the uh, more of the female backing vocals if you will and she does a fantastic job uh, on a number of these tracks which really adds a, a totally different and and other element to some of these tracks so i i really wanted to just make a point of mentioning her name um the fourth track is called fast radio burst this song i had no recollection of it was like i was listening to it for the first time i have to be honest and this one again is also giving off very modern vibes more of a mid-paced uh song a bit almost whimsical during the chorus. Um, it reminded me a lot of that middle era of Rhapsody, kind of after the first three or four albums. Um, and some of the other Luca, you know, um, albums that came out under the Rhapsody moniker before they got back with Fabio. It was just kind of reminding me of that time period. Uh, a touch repetitive, but not a bad song. But again, here, the, the production is just top notch and it's so hard to kind of bring in all of these elements and not have it sound muddy but they do a phenomenal job um just the production alone is worth listening to even if you're not a fan of the band just because of how they're able to bring all this to life you know on on a you know on an audio track it's incredible yeah i definitely wanted to mention just how sonically impressive this album is um you know I don't think Luca Turley gets enough credit as 
a guitarist. He's a, such a fantastic guitar player. And if you ever see him live, he does it with, it's effortless the way he makes it look, you know, like Ingve, it, it's like a circus. And, <laughs> and Luca Terrilli is just like, he's like this, that guy in the corner who's just like very, very mellow and very modest, but like is technically unbelievable. And the guitar solo at the end of the song about, three and a half to three forty five into it is one of my favorites on the album. Just the way that it, it, it sounds. Um, it's so cool. Uh, it, he's such a good guitar player, but he doesn't make a point to, to kind of overshadow everything else that's going on, which I think is hard to do when you have that kind of talent, but um, he, he's just such a talented guitar player, but yet he, I think he reigns it in because he doesn't want, his guitar playing to be the focus of the album. Even though it probably could be just because of how proficient and, and technically sound he is. But uh, th- there's just so much going on here that I, I think he sometimes gets overshadowed for the playing because his compositions are just as good as it gets. I mean, whether or not you are a fan of the band, I don't think anyone would deny these are just all-star compositions. Again, it may not be your thing, Quite frankly, didn't strike me the first time I heard it, but it's just um, they are they are second to none uh, in terms of the way he some of these songs are just absolutely composed and put together. Um, and, and one that was of those, probably my favorite of the the tracks I wasn't as familiar with. I just thought that that one really popped. Um, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I just thought the good, I, I just especially the guitar work. I thought was just really really shown through. Um, I, I enjoyed that a lot. I, I appreciate that. I had two for personally that really popped for me. And the next one is one of those tracks, decoding the multiverse. Uh, this song is actually like kind of, to, I hear so much anger on this track, but with, with, with keyboards and obviously Fabio singing doesn't hurt. Uh, but this, the, the keys just provide such an awesome atmosphere and there's an um, you talked about the uh, Lucas, you know, obviously Lucas guitar solo on the last track. The keyboard solo on this track is just phenomenal. And from what I understand, Luca played this one as well. So he not only is proficient in the guitar, but he's he's kind of just rolling out these keyboard solos, which are fantastic. The verses are a little quieter, but the chorus is just fast and bombastic and and, and amazing. And and the the bridge here is a bit whimsical, but it's not like the legendary tales whimsical. It's more of, I don't know, I guess a more modern, modern whimsical feel, but it doesn't take me out of the moment quite like some of that other older Rhapsody stuff does. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I think you literally made that comment when we were talking about legendary tales. Yes, about- and, and, but I, I consistent if nothing else, but this, this didn't take me out of the moment, which I, it was, is a compliment. Like that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm with you there. Um, that this is, uh, Another song I liked a lot. I mean, man, you know, like you said, like I'm not, I'm not even going to be sad if half their set list is songs from this album. I don't think it's going to be, but um, now I'm just even more excited because now I know that I love both the old and the new, which we're going to probably get a nice mix of. I'm I'm really pumped to, for the set list, and and it's man, it, it's I think it's a hard spot to be that the last band on the last day um, because you have to like, I mean, everybody's just kind of shot at that point. There is a uh, fatigue which is set in by that point, if not earlier. Um, It is a really tough act. Some people have just left at this point, right? You, you know, after a four day festival, unless you're a big fan of the band, some people are just going to call it an early night. Other people have to catch flights early the next morning. Uh, other people are, are either hungover or so intoxicated they don't quite really know where they are or what's going on. It's, it's a bad combination. Uh, it is not an enviable position, but when a band is able to put on a spectacular show in that slot, somehow people find their way back to, to the venue to see it. And um, if anybody's going to do it, I, they would be the band to do it. I have no doubt uh, about that. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of it more as a fan. Like, I just, like, kind of pulling myself up by the bootstraps and getting myself to, like, that very last set when, like, all I want to do is just, like, sit outside in the courtyard and chill and socialize and, like, you know, I feel like this is just going to be one of those things where I'm going to be too amped 
to see the set to even care that it's the last one. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty pumped about it. I, I'm not, I don't plan on missing a second. I, this, I had a feeling, set. I had a feeling you might say that. And, uh, to be honest with you, I think if I'm not mistaken, you might be, uh, getting ready to celebrate something that week. So it's, it, it's, or, or is it even that night? Actually, I think it's that night that you'd be it is. celebrating it's, something. That's going to be my, my big birthday gift is to, be able to sponsor Rhapsody as the uh, during the last set at Prague Power. So um, I'm hoping that um, yeah, I'm hoping Fabio and Luca come back to my party at the courtyard. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be holding court in your uh, in your spot? But that's a story for for story for another day and another podcast. Um, the the sixth track here is is the one kind of interlude track, if you will. It's called Origins. I don't really have any strong thoughts about this. I think it was a good thing to break up a little bit of, of the album because I needed a break after those first five tracks. Uh, this one is a little bit nondescript in, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cool. Um, has some cool like vocal elements to it. Uh, I mean, the, the orchestrations are phenomenal just like on the rest of the album. Um, so it doesn't particularly stand out, but I think it is a good kind of just little breather uh, before it gets back to, you know, the next, uh, the next, uh, full length tune, which is, uh, called multi dimensional. Any thoughts about this before I, uh, cause I have, I have a couple things I want to say about this one. Um, I like this one too. Um, like really catchy chorus, um, kind of, a, again, like you said, like a kind of a, a, a mid tempo kind of tune, but I feel like, um, you know, these are the, some of the songs that I think that this version of Rhapsody is really is, excels at. Whereas, you know, the old days of Rhapsody, I always think of like those, those banger type songs like Land of Immortals or, or Warrior of Ice or Emerald Sword. Or they just kind of like just pick you up out of your chair and just throw you against the wall. And these ones are just kind of like just these really magnificent, uh, well, just well written, well performed mid-tempo kind of songs that I feel like are hard to kind of make interesting in this power metal genre. And I think that Rhapsody just makes it work. It's This is another fantastic song. I had uh, two tracks that kind of stood out for me this time around, tracks that I either didn't remember or tracks that just didn't impress upon me the first time around. This is the second one, and this is actually going to be my song of the week. When you listen to this track, I cannot help but think of Epica. This to me is like, it could have been an Epica track, and that's a huge compliment because, you know, obviously we're, we're big fans of them. Um, it, it, but if Simone and Mark were singing and kind of trading vocals on this track, I would have had no idea that Luca Torelli wrote it. It's just perfect. The sound effects samples at the beginning are really, really cool. And even though it sounds nothing like the old Rhapsody, the way the song is constructed, it reminds me of Rhapsody just in terms of the, the construct of the song. Um, heavy, great orchestration, and just like a beautiful headbanger. And to your point, you mentioned the chorus. This is my favorite chorus on the album. It's my song of the week just so I can hear it again. It, it boggles my mind that this is the same guy who sings for Angra. Like it, it's his ability to morph into whatever band he's in. And I mean, he's guested on God knows how many tracks over the years for God knows how many bands. And, you know, we got to see him sing with Camelot before they, you know, landed on a permanent replacement for Khan. Um, 
And I was like thinking to myself, what the hell kind of sense does that make having Fabio Leone sing with Camelot? And boy, he proved me wrong. I thought he was phenomenal. I, I, I thought that he just, he, he just has this way. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again because it's, it's just an incredible thing to listen to. But go and listen to the duet he does with Taria on the, the Angels Cry, uh, 20, 25th, whatever anniversary Blu-ray DVD. Um, I want to say it's stand away. Um, oh my God. Like he, the way he can actually do operatic vocals too. And this is a guy who's like a, a very heavy smoker. Like you would think, you know, at this point in his life, um, it would come, it would, you know, this bill would come due, if you will, as far as his voice would go and he would sound like crap, but nope. Uh, he just, some people are just blessed, I guess. Um, and, and he just still is incredible. I'm so excited to just hear him sing, like just to see him be on stage. And he has such a great presence about him too. He's not one of those just stand there and sing types. He, he's animated and, and he's into it and he's fun to watch. He's a photographer's dream front front man. Uh, I'm sure Carl Frederick will probably snap a few photos. Uh, no doubt. And I may have mentioned this in the past. If I have, I apologize, but it's, it's definitely timely and worth noting again. When they played Prague Power last time and he was singing for Angra, I spoke with him at length after the set and he was about as modest as they come you could tell from the conversation, and I'm paraphrasing, one of the things that he believes helps him stand apart from others is his ability to sing in these different styles. Um, it, it's, it's that chameleon effect where he can, bl- he can sing for Angra and it works. He can sing this style and it works. And to your point, I was not looking forward to seeing him sing for Camelot. I just didn't think it was going to be very good if I'm being honest. It was fantastic. His ability to kind of shape shift and morph and do all these different things is why he is an elite vocalist. And I will be the first to admit it. I never understood why people went crazy for him 25 years ago when I first heard Rhapsody, when I first heard Vision Divine, when I first heard Labyrinth. I just never understood it. I liked his vocals. I never loved his vocals. And then all of a sudden it clicked and I realized this guy is like, this, this, this is like master class stuff here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've talked to a number of people that are just not a fan. And sometimes someone has a tone or whatever, and it just doesn't work for you. I mean, I know people that like will swear up and down that they can't listen to Rush because of Getty Lee. Um, you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, I, have, I've, I loved him from the beginning, and I, I still do. And his longevity has been incredible. Um, we talked about that, that first vision divine album where like, I didn't even think it sounded like the same guy who was on that first Rhapsody album. Um, and, and again, like just, th- um, another one of my favorite tracks he does is with anger. They do a cover of the police's synchronicity Two, which yes. is like maybe one of my favorite police songs. And, and like, that's another just kick ass song. Plus, uh, Raphael does, um, the second verse, which is kind of cool too. Um, so he does, he does some singing on there as well. He's, it seems like he's been doing a bit more of that, um, since, uh, since Fabio has joined the band, um, you know, sidebar aside, um, what did you think of Amata Immortale? So I, I had mentioned that this album was not perfect. This is a track and this, this, and I'll just kind of put it out there. This and the last track were two songs that for some reason I just couldn't get into. This this one, I wanted to like it and I appreciated it. So it's not like I can say that I didn't just appreciate this ballad. Uh, but for some reason, it didn't click. Now, I, I don't know why. It's got an awesome piano intro. Very, very operatic. And it's just a beautiful song. And I think that Fabio... It might be his best vocal performance on the entire album, if I'm being frank. But the, for some reason, the song itself didn't click for me, even though I think it should have. Again, maybe it was a fatigue thing. I'm not sure. So I, I, I'm not going to say it was my favorite by any means. Um, but I can appreciate I can appreciate it for what it was. Do you have a ch- difference of opinion? Uh, I probably like it a little bit more than you do. I just think that it's a very... Um... 
It's more of, of a like slowed down. I don't even know if I want to call it a ballad just because it's so, it's so orchestral and, and kind of classical music. And it has like, you know, these o- opera style vocals and it, it, it's definitely a, an outlier on this album. Um, but it's also not atypical for Rhapsody to have kind of like a foreign language ballad type slower. It's, it's waltzy. Like the, the, it has kind of a waltzy kind of feel to it. I almost feel like I'm in a haunted ballroom in a Castlevania game when I hear a song like this. Um, it's, it's not my favorite style of what Rhapsody does, but I, it's also done really well. I mean, this is, I agree with you, Fabio, doing the, showing that he can do that opera style. Um, it, it, I, it, I, it took me years to realize that he, even did that um, because he never really showed it off on, on any album that I was aware of. Um, so it's worth listening to, I think more to appreciate the, the musicianship and the vocals of it um, as a song. I don't think it's particularly memorable, but um, I think it's just a really well done performance. And it really, I think it's actually a really good way to kick, kick off the next track, which is uh, I am, which um, is, I think, yeah, the longest track on the album at, at seven minutes and 15 seconds. But, boy, talk about a song that doesn't drag at all. It, it just kicks ass for, for seven minutes. And I have to believe that um, that Simone Mulroney had a little bit of something to do with this because there it kind of has a little bit of that DGM kind of flavor to it. And the fact that it has their vocalist, Mark Basile, uh, doing some of the guest vocals on here. Um and I, I, I think that Simone, I don't know if he helped produce this album with Luca and Fabio, but I know he was, he was there. Um, yeah, it looks like he record, it helped with the recording and the mixing and the mastering. And he had some solos on this and, and fast radio bursts, which makes complete sense. But, um, yeah, I have a feeling that you have a lot, a lot of good things to say about this one. This, I, I do. I, I actually love this track. The musicianship is on like full display and, so is the songwriting because this is like the most complex, I think, piece on the album because it's a little bit all over the place. I, I agree uh, with you. I, I want to say two other things. Number one, I love the layered backing vocals in this track. I think it's fantastic. The hardest thing for me to do though is describe it. And I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to kind of put it all together, but this is like part Disney soundtrack, part sabotage part Queen, and part Classic Rhapsody. Throw them all together, mix them up, spit it out, and that's what this is. I don't even know what it means, but that's to me, that's what I hear. Uh, I mean, those are all wonderful things. So. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Uh, and we get into the final track before the bonus track, which is Arcanum, Da Vinci's Enigma. This one, you, you mentioned Castlevania uh, you know, a couple of tracks ago. This, this was the Castlevania track to me. Really, really interesting tune with an epic feel, very operatic. Took me out of it a little bit. In other words, I liked the song, but for some reason at the end it felt a little, I I don't know, like a little bit like we went off the rails a little bit for some reason, even though the song itself I thought was quite good. Um, Very, very dense song, and just like by the end of this point, I think my head was like ready to explode. I think I needed to almost (laughs) like stop and listen to, to something else. Um, but the track is good for what it is. I'm curious to see if you liked it as well. I liked it a lot. I, I it's, it was, I, I thought it was a great way. If you're not counting the, the, the cover bonus track, um, I thought this was a great way to kind of finish things off. I think they could have gotten away with ending the album with I am, and it would have still been just as good, but I mean, I, 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 I tend just to agree. This, yeah. I think this is, I, 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 it's, it's a little, a little bit more understated, but not by a lot. Um, but again, it's, it's just a lot of layers of stuff, a lot of like choral vocals. And, um, I'd be, you know, I'd be curious. There's something I was thinking about, um, earlier today is I wonder, and feel free to reach out to us on social media to answer this question, but, uh, for the people that listen to the, the episodes and aren't as familiar with the, the album, I'm curious if you listen to the album before or after listening to the podcast, because I would I would totally suggest listening to the album before. I feel like all, like it, it, 
makes what we're saying make a hell of a lot more sense if you <laughs> are familiar with what we're, you know, what we're talking to. But especially if like right before you listen to the episode, you uh, go back, you go and listen to the album. Um, and that's why I'm just, why curious, I, I'm just curious how, how people do it. Um, Cause if it was me, that's, I would probably listen to the album like every week prior to listening to the podcast. Yeah. And to be honest, that's what I, that's why we, you know, announced the album in advance 99 out of 100 times just because I think it does – I think it paints our conversation or kind of directs the conversation a little bit. Uh, if you have some understanding or at least have heard the album once, I, maybe you don't even need to listen to it a lot. But just listen to it once so you have some color uh, on the canvas that we're screwing up for everybody. <laughs> we're trying to paint the picture for everyone. So uh, I say that. And then the, the cover, I didn't even realize this this last track um, – Oceano, I didn't realize it was a cover until you brought it to my attention. We don't really talk about the album much during the week, but you had told me that this was a Josh Groban cover. I had no idea. Yeah, um, it it didn't. It almost like when I was listening to the album, like it didn't seem out of place. Um, because just because like there's so many different kinds of styles of classical music, and, and the fact that it's sung in i believe italian um please correct me if i'm wrong but i think it's italian um which is completely not unusual for an italian guy (laughs) so no i guess that makes sense (laughs) i thought it was like a bit of an outlier but it makes sense that it's a bonus track right so like in other words it fits as a bonus track i don't know if it would have fit as like the eighth track on the album (laughs) but it's it's like a bit of an outlier I think it, it, I think it should be the last song because it's, it feels like credits. It feels like closing credits. Nice. Um, and so like in a way, I just think it, it makes sense to, to kind of tack it on at the end. It's super like, it's super chill, but Fabio's vocals again are just like out of this world. He kind of, it's kind of like a cross between his, his regular power metal voice and his operatic style. Um, I went back and actually listened to the Josh Groban version of it just because I'd never heard it before, and um, it's it's fairly it's fairly similar um, because it's not like a, not a very heavy metal ish kind of version of it that Rhapsody did. They kind of kept it to more of a um, symphonic classical style, um, but uh, what a cool choice for a cover song! Like definitely recommend uh, going out of your way to, to check this one out just because like. Fabio, how he can go from like those whispering vocals that he does so well to like this belted out opera style, like this, just like from a mouse to a lion. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's just very impressive and it doesn't feel like it doesn't belong on the album, which sometimes bonus tracks can tend to do. Um, I think if, if I didn't know it was a bonus track or I didn't know it was a cover, I don't think I would have questioned it here's what I'll say. I am not going to profess that I'm the biggest Josh Groban fan, but I will recognize the fact that the man has a phenomenal voice. I mean, just, I I don't think anyone on the planet would say that the man is not a great singer. I mean, he's he's as good as it gets in terms of vocals, the guts to cover this song and for Fabio to do the job that he did is like the biggest compliment I can give him because he's truly trying to, I'm not going to say replicate, but put his spin on one of the greatest vocalists of our generation. And I'm not talking about metal. I'm just saying singers, just one of the best singers, hands down. And Fabio does a very, 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 very nice job. So, I mean, that's, that's all you really need to know right there. Just it's, it's, it's highlighting Fabio as, as um, the, the vocalist that he is. Yeah, the last minute is just the like the the key changes and it goes up slightly and he's yep. like right yep. on point. It's really it's just a really impressive tune. I, I I have to say like I think the both of us um dropped the ball on this album. Um and it's funny because I hadn't yet started to like make my list of albums of the year, but I do remember in 2019 what this album was competing with for my attention. And that would include Beast in Black's From Hell with Love album, um, which wasn't even my album of the year that year. Um, it was my runner up because 
the glory hammer um <laughs> legends from beyond the galactic uh almost said galactic terror squid the galactic <laughs> terror vortex was actually my album of the year i was so obsessed with that album that i, I couldn't that as good as that beast in black album was it, it couldn't get over the hump that that glory hammer created then you had majestica um releasing their first album under the majestica name and and you know formerly rain seed one of my favorite bands ever they released their debut above the sky which i listened to the other day for its um i guess it had been three years to the day that it was released and boy that that was another phenomenal album i believe that was my number three my number four was ancient bard's origin album which was another absolute fantastic album and then my number five album was the was voyagers colors in the sun so i mean it was a really strong year i was looking back i just while you were talking i was looking at my list that was a really good year for music and quite frankly i think it's off to a better start than this year has been but that's a discussion for another day um for for this album would have made my list if there was a list and i actually listened to the album the way i listened to it this week oh I yeah it, for sure it would have been in my it definitely would have been in my top 25 that year i have to i have to think there you go i i, I like it um obviously i want your your score on a scale of one to ten but i need your track of the week first Did, have we cemented it with dna or are we going in a different direction yeah i think i'll, I'll stick with that i think uh i'll go with my first instinct on that but i mean man any one of these songs really um just a, a really really good album I, I i was afraid that it was going to be uh too top heavy because i was already familiar with the first three songs but the rest of the album really delivered for me um so i uh i'm gonna give it an 8.5 wow that's a that is a impressive score i'm gonna give it a 7.75 i don't think it was completely flawless it was almost too much if that's a if that's a thing but really it's really good <laughs> yeah there you go uh, you know but it's funny I, I i'll say this if you would have asked me what the score was prior to listening to it i don't know if i would have given it higher than a seven so it, it went up almost an entire point just by you know kind of going back in and, and and doing a deep dive so very good 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 choice and uh has completely changed my um excitement level for for this band which we'll we get to see in another six weeks yeah and i think now you'll probably feel excited about you know just about anything that they decide to play that night yeah oh no question about it because this was like the biggest hole in my uh fandom if you will and now i don't feel like there's a gaping hole there so that, that's good uh just it one good to remove the gaping hole from my life <laughs> just one i don't know that they're i don't know that they would be would play anything outside of like anything that that they did when Luca was in the original Rhapsody slash Rhapsody of Fire, and then this album. I don't know that they're going to touch on any of Luca's solo albums or even the Luca Torelli's Rhapsody two albums. I think I don't think so. There's think enough just focus on, um, you know, just what was on. I mean, based on some, I haven't seen a set list from them in since 2020 so i'm sure that there'll be there'll be something different but uh it looks like they for the most part kind of stick to 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 this album and then the older rapsy stuff that luca was was in the band for there was so much material from that first run of albums and of course, this this album as well, with with a number of songs that I think would fit well in a live setting. I don't think they're going to touch anything else, just because there's so much material to choose from. I don't see the need. I would be very surprised, but you know, strange, stranger things have happened. Well, I'm looking at the set that they did in in Mexico in March of 2020, and I'm just saying, if they played this exact set list, you would wouldn't hear a complaint out of me. I mean, happy birthday. Yeah, I mean, seriously, like, I mean, there's a a plethora of Rhapsody songs. I would love to hear that. They're just not going to have <laughs> enough time to get to, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm whatever they play, I think is just going to be gravy at that, at that point in the weekend. And, and I'm just excited because sometimes I'm just out of juice by the time that last band comes on. I mean, even I think the last time we went demons and wizards was the last band on Saturday. And, 
I made it. I pro like I forced myself to stay for the Valhalla cover of Blind Guardian. Um, but then I, I just had to leave. I just could not just be in that venue anymore. It just I I was just you just get burned out. Four days of of uh, listening to stand. It's a lot of it is just physically. You're just standing a lot, and that I think you know when you get to be you know forty, which is going to be the magic number. <laughs> It, every year is like more of a, a struggle to stand there for hours at a, at a time. So, uh, but um, I mean, I, I, I would probably say not since John Oliva did streets. Have I been this excited about the Saturday night headliner? So yeah, that, that, and that's great company to be in for sure. Um, and it'll be here before you know it. Um, just one quick news item for this week, a band who I am, I really enjoyed the the first single from the Halo Effect, and for those that don't know, these were the guys from In Flames that left the band. They kind of reformed this new project. They came out with a single, Days of the Lost, and as it turns out, their album by the same name is due out on August twelfth on Nuclear Blast. I think that that is going to be a really, really strong album and something I'm going to keep an eye on. I think there's a place in the top fifty somewhere for this album if it's as good as I expect. I don't know where that's going to be, but I have to reserve a spot for what I think might be this album as we get closer to as we get closer to August. So we'll see what happens. Um, obviously, it's not a, a lot. On, I saw a comment on Facebook this week that said um, that this band is making <laughs> whatever in flames did in the past look bad by comparison. So I suspect that is going to be the case. Um, this, the, the guys in the band are kind of the driving force behind some of that early fantastic in flames material. And they've kind of gone in a different direction since then. So we'll see what happens. Um, but with that, it is uh, a time for me to pick an album. And I feel like it's been a while only because I had picked that heaven's gate album so long ago that I completely forgot that uh, it was almost my, my turn to pick something. So we're going to do something a little bit different this week. We are going to play The Metal Exchange, Let's Make a Deal. And by that, I mean I've got three albums, Behind Curtain 1, Behind Curtain 2, and Behind Curtain 3. Now, before I have you choose one of the curtains, I will tell you this. Each one of these is in a different genre. So it's not like they're three power metal albums or three prog albums. Uh, but I'm not going to give you any other information. I'm just going to tell you A, B, or C. I want you to choose, and then I will tell you... Uh, the genres you didn't choose and the album that you have selected. Oh, so I, I'm not and, I, and by the way, I want to be clear. I have it on this post-it note right here, so I'm not making this up. I actually have this written out for you. Uh, I, I, I'll just say num- uh, door number two. Door number two. Okay. Well, the first album uh, in, uh, behind door number A was kind of a classic uh, metal album, which you did not select, and and that's all well and good. I have a feeling we'll do that at some point in the future. Behind door number C was a thrash album, which uh, at some point I know we will cover in the future, but this is not the week. You have selected door number B, which is a prog rock album, Spock's Beards 5, which is a really, really good album, but there is a catch. If you want to trade in the Spock's Bearded album for the unknown door to my right, door number D, I will give you the option of trading in for a blind album. Now, it's not in one of those three genres. It's com- something completely different. Could be power metal. Could be black metal. Could be 90s alternative. I don't know what's behind the door. I mean, I, obviously, you see the curtain is up. But I want to give you the choice of trading in Spock's beard for behind what's door behind door D. I leave it up to you. You know, you know what? I'm going to keep my Spock's beard uh, choice. Um because the the very little that I've heard of Spock's beard over the years, I've enjoyed a lot. Um, it's just, I guess, one of those bands where it's just the the amount and some of the lengths of some of the songs are just a little bit overwhelming to the point where I just was like, ugh, shrug. Um, I just I know um, all on a Sunday from this album is a, a really great song. I love on a perfect day from. Um, their self-titled album from 2006 is probably my my all-time favorite song by them. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this is a good choice. I'm going to hang on to that. I'm glad you did. I'm happy to cover it. And I will not even tell you what you have passed on unless you want to know. It's, I leave that up to you. You want to leave it as no, surprise? No, I'm sure, I'm sure that you'll, um, you'll want to use it at, at a later time. So keep that one in your, in your holster. 
We'll do. We'll do. Uh, look forward to covering some Spots Beard next week. Uh, a band that I'll just say this: this was my first exposure to the band. It still remains my favorite Spots Beard album, and I think I've listened to them all at this point. Um, it's funny. It's it's not the longest album in the world. There's only six tracks. Two of them are over 15 minutes, and one of them is 27 minutes. So <laughs> strap in and get, get ready to listen. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to critique every second of the song, uh, especially when it's 30 minutes long. Uh, but I, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised at how much you like this. Uh, yeah, that's kind of my hope. And, uh, yeah, I'm always down to kind of listen to something that I definitely missed in this album came out. 22 years ago, and I definitely missed it. (laughs) There you go. Uh, Spots Beard next week. Thanks for listening. Uh, Give us a like and a follow and a review if you don't mind. It helps other people find the show, and we will come back with some progressive rock next week. Uh, Do we need to invite invite Mike on the show to explain what Spock's Beard means? Or um, Yeah, because I have no idea. I I have a feeling it's a Star Trek reference, but I'm uh, going to plead the fifth on this because I truly – don't know that for sure, and I might oh. just be making a fool of myself. Maybe we're gonna. Maybe I have to call him and uh, have him record like a quick clip of an explanation. <laughs> um, because as far as I know, it, it is a is a Star Trek reference. But I am definitely that's all I know, though. Like I literally can't go any deeper than no, that. No, so. I know as much about Star Trek as I know about Spock's beard. So, <laughs> which is which is not a whole hell of a lot. So, not a whole hell of a lot. Of we'll, we'll we'll learn together. But uh, enjoy the week, and I will talk to you soon. All right, live long and prosper. <laughs>